Thank you very much. Uh, I think it was an interesting session. Now we can uh, we can go to your seats if you wish. If you, if you wish, you can stay with me here so that I don't feel alone. <laughs> Thanks for accompanying me for the last uh, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. So now we have, we are ending our session, but I hopefully, I'm sure it will be an excellent, another excellent uh, keynote speech by Professor uh, Kemal and Celestia. Another round of applause for him, please. Together with us, his presentation on science and soil liquefaction assessments, a critical overview. But before he starts his presentation, I'd like to say a few words about him. Uh, uh, obviously, everybody knows him, I think, <laughs> here, but uh, I just want to summarize uh, some, of the, uh, some of his background. So, Professor Chetin obtained his uh, PhD from the uh, University of California, Berkeley, and uh, he has been a professor uh, since 2009 in Middle East Technical University. Uh, teaching in the field of teaching, making research, and consulting in the field of geotechnical earthquake engineering. Um, he's, uh, he received the ASC Geo Institute uh, Award uh, called Thomas A. Middlebrook's Outstanding Professional Accomplishment. And uh, since then, his, uh, his method study developed in his study became widely accepted and used in engineering uh, practice, such as uh, ASHTO 2010. Uh, he consulted uh, Istanbul Marmaray Submerged Tunnel project, and uh, he was a consultant in that project and uh, in other projects, such as uh, FLF Geothermal Power Plant, Yemen Cycle Michigan Highway Tunnel, uh, to Embashi International Seaports, Akri and Sinop nuclear power plants. He is a consultant to the International Atomic Energy Agency and um, for, for whom he uh, consult, gives consultants on size and hazard geotechnical aspects and hazards in site evaluation and safety requirements for nuclear power plants. Professor, the stage is yours. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Professor Chairman, the organization committee, and uh, more importantly, uh, my colleagues, I would like to welcome you all. Have a wonderful rest of the uh, afternoon. Uh, it's obvious that we're all a bunch of crazy people. It's a beautiful day outside, sun is shining, there's a wonderful beach uh, which you could en enjoy. And instead of doing that, you are here listening to some wonderful talks, excluding mine, but uh, you should all admit that this is not the way to go. Uh, and hopefully, like, in about 50 years, we will all change and start enjoying the beach, because probably it will take 50 years for me to adjust to that mentality. Uh, having said that, uh, I would like to mention this is an extremely valuable, and from my perspective, uh, a very crowded audience for two reasons. Uh, the topic we are discussing is rather unique because it is laboratory testing and it is soil liquefaction, and moreover, we're combining those two topics. So it is laboratory testing about soil liquefaction. So please uh, just join me uh, to look around. These are pretty much all the people, or I would say, majority of the people who work on this topic. So if you're expecting an audience level of uh, 500 people uh, in this room, it doesn't exist. We're not that many. So we're, we're just really like low in numbers. And uh, we will uh, probably learn from each other through this specialty workshops. So having said that, what I would like to do today is uh, I'm going to talk about the discrepancy between uh, case histories or semi empirical based methods and laboratory based methods with special emphasis on soil liquefaction. But before that, I would like to acknowledge uh, my PhD uh, students who, as you can imagine, uh, pretty much tailored all the presentation. So I am enjoying the luxury of just 
sharing that presentation with you. And I truly acknowledge all their hard work. Uh, a broken heart, uh, black people, we enjoy, we think like we can find the answer through liberty. And cases to people, sometimes they make fun of the other group because I belong to both sides. That's why I don't use the word we. Uh, and we say like, oh, the field is different. In the field, the stress conditions are different. The density state is different. Or oh, there are aging effects in the field. Or in the laboratory, we have a, like a five centimeter thick soil set. You know, in the, in the real life, it's 10 meters, 20 meters, 30 meters. And then we sometimes like, don't like the laboratory-based uh, methods. And the other group says, hey, like if you would like to develop methods based on field data, you have to wait 10 million years to get the answers for your question. Because, you know, life doesn't create earthquakes quite often, and I'm crossing my finger, uh, thank God. Uh, and also, some of the answers that we get are not really the answers for the questions that we're asking. Uh, so that is why uh, we need to find a way to basically patch that problem, and that will be the outline of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to focus on with the production engineering steps. And in that regard, I will particularly focus on two aspects, which is liquefaction susceptibility and liquefaction triggering. And I would like to show or emphasize the contributions from laboratory-based methods and field-based methods. And hopefully by the end of the presentation, we'll make the piece and then we will appreciate both the field and the laboratory-based methods because we need both of them. And that will be the uh, basically the, the general uh, idea behind my presentation today. So having said that, I will start with the definitions. Why definition? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, because everybody has a different definition of liquefaction. Uh, and that's why we need to start with the definition first. So at least you will know what I refer to as liquefaction. Significant reduction in shear strength and stiffness. This part is understandable. Uh, probably remaining part will be the major focus due to increase in pore water pressure. So you all know that we have sensitive clays, for example, are pre cropped clays. Uh, they reduce their uh, strength and stiffness significantly after remolding. Not due to increase in pore pressure, but remolding. That's a similar phenomenon, but it's not really like within the scope of uh, seismic solar diffraction. Maybe under monotonic conditions, we may assess that problem, but not under seismic conditions with the methods that at least we have. So, uh, having given that definition, I would like to talk about surface manifestation. So, in the field, Professor, how do you understand that we have with diffraction triggered? And then uh, Basically, uh, I will show you a lot of slides, but we have some particular surface manifestations that can remind us that liquefaction is triggered at the field. And then recently, even though we don't have ver uh, surface manifestations, at vertical array sites, by looking at the records phase shift, we can judge if liquefaction was triggered or not. So even though you don't see that, you know it, it's somewhere in the soil that uh, some may have liquefied. And this is relatively new trend uh, in, in, in engineering practice. Having said that, beautiful pictures. We have sand boils, lateral spread, uh, slope stability, liquefaction induced dam failures. Uh, they don't have nationalities, good news. You know, some of this is from uh, basically United States, Turkey, United States, Japan, and so on. So the basic you know, the protection doesn't have a nationality. It's an international problem that, you know, the reason I'm saying that in a teasing way, uh, some of us may think that that's the case. Uh, structural damages, that's why we're interested in. 
a lot of examples, repeated itself, 1964, uh, Kobe earthquake, and then later on, 1999, Kojeli earthquake. They all start with K, but structures were affected with the same way, Kipaction created similar damage, and so on. Laboratory. In the laboratory, what do we do? We perform some tests, and then based on the response of the soil, we say, okay, soil is liquefied. And then we further classify that under flow liquefaction, cyclic softening, cyclic mobility, and then cyclic liquefaction. And these forms are slightly different. Uh, I don't want to go into the details, but in the laboratory, we have better understanding of the soil response. Build surface manifestation. Laboratory, we look, up, look at the response and then come up with a uh, judgment if the soil would be fine or not. What is the basis of that judgment? Some of us use strain based threshold. If we reach to 3% single amplitude axial strain after so many number of cycles, I say soil is a point. Why 3%? What's the answer? Why not? Some people say, no, 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 it's not 3%, it's 5%, 1.5%, 2.5%. They, we don't have a consensus about the strain level. Then some of us come up with other kind of definitions, like excess flow pressure ratio, R sub U, and then say, oh, oh anyway, if you reach the 0.8, then I will judge that so is liquefied. How about 0.95? Some of us use 0.85, 1.0, that's also possible. And so, so basically, we have some subjective thresholds uh, in the laboratory that we use to judge if soil was liquefied or not. And some of us, this is proposing development of banana loops, which I will discuss in a little bit. So this is how we define uh, basically soil liquefaction triggering in the field. Uh, a typical cyclic simple shear test data, dilation contraction cycles, do you see the banana loop? Looks like a banana. So if that develops, I will say, oh, okay, so I'm looking fine. Again, judgmental, again, subjective. And some other people would say, oh, right, it's not the banana loop, it's actually the shear strain that we should look at. Or some people say, no, 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 it's the excess pore pressure we should focus on. Uh, bottom line, what I would like to emphasize is our definitions in the laboratory. For the triggering of liquefaction, it's not also unique. It's subjective. Having said that, cyclic mobility applicable to clay soils. So clay soils, they exhibit basically American football type of stress strain loops when you cyclically mobilize it. Uh, if you define cyclic mobility, as part of your soil liquefaction definition, then yes, clay soils are liquefiable. But then you will say, no, 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 Professor, come on. I mean, we, we know that clay soils are not liquefiable. Then I will propose maybe cyclic liquefaction definition where you focus on the banana loops. Again, uh, my goal is to confuse you a little bit. So I know you were expecting some answers, but I will choose the other way then. I'll try to confuse you uh, because I'm confused. Uh, I will just openly share some of the problems uh, that I'm facing with. Liquefaction engineering assessment. There are five steps that we follow as engineers. The first step is, Professor, do we have liquefiable soils, susceptible soils? And the next question is, will they liquefy during a scenario as well? Then the next question is, Professor, if I liquefy, what is my strength after liquefaction? Then the next question is, I know I will liquefy, now I learned my shear strength, then how much deformation, how much settlement, how much lateral movement uh, are we expecting from my uh, soil uh, site? And then fourth step, consequences of those deformations. Oh, Professor, I have a two-story building. Will the structure be affected? Uh, by the way, don't forget that at the end of the day, we are trying to help structural engineers 
to provide a safe performance for the structures that we occupy. So I see some structural engineers smiling with great joy, but that's what your technical engineers do uh, with a few exceptions. Sometimes, such as earthfill dams, they are allergy. So it's not like it doesn't belong to structural engineers, directly our field that we have. So I'm going to focus in this presentation, particularly on susceptible soils and then liquefaction trees. With that, this is all the contributions from the laboratory and from the field. Let's start with susceptible soils. Field data, 1970s. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I strongly recommend uh, the value of uh, proper literature. Study. And the reason I'm saying that, uh, recently I observed that we have a wonderful tendency to forget good quality old work. And we keep on repeating that again and again, 30 years later, and reach to the same conclusion because we don't do good quality uh, literature. So, uh, Kushida, 1970s, he studied Akita Port after 1964, he got an earthquake. Akita Port is full of vertical layers, very important for Japan because Japan, the ports for Japan is. Very wide So, uh, and this is back then when we didn't know much about liquefaction. So, Tushida said something weird is happening in my strong ground motion records. As simple as that. He was referring to the phase shifts. So, but he was defining it something weird. And then he said the soil below within one and a half meter of the Water level should be responsible for that. Remember, back then, 1970s, we did not understand liquefaction so well. So he said, I'm going to look at the soils, one and a half meters below groundwater table, collect some data, and then he plotted them. And then he called them very easily liquefied and easily liquefied. That was his terminology. These are original uh, plots from him. Actually, this is the IAS 1986 and 89 version. Also, Kushida is one of the authors in here. Uh, interesting thing is, look at it like well graded soils, more liquefiable. Huh? That was interesting. I don't think so. But that's what he was suggesting. If you look at the band, it was like a wider band there. So uh, where did this data come from? From the field observations. So we were, we're still using, some of us are referring to that study uh, when they're performing susceptibility assessments. Uh, Chinese structure. Case histories. After uh, tension earthquake. Observations are all like some surface manifestations here. No manifestations over there. Uh, why not? And then perform some site investigation. They found out that if the soil falls into the shaded category, then no surface manifestation. For what? For that particular event. It's not a general event that is valid for all the uh, earthquake magnitudes and shaping levels. And then guess what? We forget about that. And we adopted that event specific criteria for our, for our all assessments, wherever we are, whatever the magnitude, whatever the number of cycles are, we say, okay, I'm going to use Chinese criteria. So uh, I love it. We forget things very easy. Uh, Andrews and Martin, uh, he realized that the Japanese definitions are not in conformance with ASTM standards. Japanese call it clay when it's less than five micron. So in fact, in our case, ASTM, if you stick to it, it's two microns. So he adjusted for that. And also like the uh, liquid limit measurements with basically pollen cone uh, versus Cassegrandri's uh, percussion uh, tests. So there will be like a 3%, 4% difference. He applied those corrections and he eliminated Water content 0.9 limit. Why? I don't know. Recently, checking 
and his colleagues, his friends, they accumulate, they basically like uh, plotted the grain size distribution curves of the susceptible layers. Remember, they have a liquefaction triggering relationship. And there are critical layers that establish the basis of that relationship. So he went back and he found grain size distribution curves of those critical layers and plotted them. So if you believe in that, gravel is all going to liquefy. Did you vote for it? No. Why? Because chicken's method was for SVD and gravels. We don't have, we can't perform SVD. That's why the data was missing. Also, fine grain portion of the store is missing. So the reason I'm trying to, and then they develop probabilistic boundary groups and so on. Uh, but again, please don't fall for it. These are biased. Gravel data wasn't there. And fine portion is not there because this kind of grain size distribution curve based assessments are usually valid for coarse grain source, not fine grain source. And when I refer to coarse grain, most I'm referring to semi source. So, uh, but at least now we have probabilistic boundaries. So you can say, okay, my grain size distribution falls into this, this region. There is a 5% chance that I will liquefy and that susceptible to liquefaction. So that was the discussion. Same exercise was performed in the CPT domain. Again, field is supporting our data. And we have plotted that, but now the problem is, oops, I don't have any data here. Can I say clay soles are not liquefiable or silt clay sand mixtures? They're not. No, actually, all I can say there is a transition. What is the transition? I don't know. Who knows it? I, I know it. Let's wait 10 million years. Let's accumulate more cases. To this. One day I believe we will have some data. And then 10 million years later, I will come and present. And say, like, oh, now I have the data. Uh, we need leverage. And the gap needs to be filled with the contributions from the lab team. And that's what I would like to continue. Uh, I have overlaid some of the data. By looking at the data, you can say, hey, look, there's no cases that is falling on the right hand side of PI 12 curve online. So soils with PI 12%, maybe not susceptible to liquefaction. But again, ask me, what is the definition of liquefaction? Professor Ishara, 1996, where am I discussing now? Laboratory based methods. He developed this. Guess what? We forgot that he developed it is for, uh, by using laboratory tests. And then we says any soil with a PI greater than 10 is not susceptible. Does Professor Ishiara say that? No. He just developed this plot. And what he's saying is resistance increases with increasing PI. He, he says nothing about susceptibility. But we distort this story. When I say we, that's me. I distort this story. And everybody falls for it. And then we follow it because we believe in the lie that we create. So uh, beautiful laboratory-based methods, but the problem is for susceptibility and uh, laboratory testing and uh, stress-based or capacity or demand-based conclusions are problematic. See it all. I am one of the authors of that study. Uh, perform CSR uh, samples from other positive CSR 0 0.3, 0.4, 0.5, 3% single amplitude axis. If they observe that in 20 cycles, they say soil liquefies. If they don't observe 3% axial uh, single amplitude strain, they say no, not liquefied. And they will have this boundary group. Why? Because their purpose was to assess other positive soils after cogenic earthquakes. Cogenic earthquake produced CSR levels of 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 in other positive. And cogenic earthquake. Produce 20 num uh, equivalent number of cycles. 
So that's why they were doing our study. And guess what? We again forgot the purpose of the study. And now this is our widely used susceptibility relationship for silk and scent mixtures. Ray and Sanjil, same data set, same kind of presentation, same arguments, also them. And Boulanger and Idris, Professor Boulanger and Idris produced this chart not for susceptibility. Again, laboratory based conclusion. They produced this chart so that if you fall in the scent like region, then they say, please go ahead and use chatting at all. Semi empirical cases to the base relationship. If you fall into the clay like region, don't use chatting. I'm joking, but they don't say chatting. They say, Boulanger Idris. So I'm teasing them. Uh, but the essence of the story, the purpose of this graph is not for susceptibility. It's in fact suitability of semi empirical methods that we use for our purpose. So if you fall into clay like they say, don't use semi empirical methods because they're not applicable. Anyways, uh, Chetin and Wilger recently, they performed laboratory tests. And then they said CSR based susceptibility assessment. None of cycle based susceptibility assessments are erroneous because they are two parameters. Susceptibility should be an intrinsic character of the soil, and then they look at the banana roots. Yes, banana roots, no banana root. Yes, banana root, it's a characteristic behavior, no banana root, and other behavior. That's circles. I, I'm following my time, I'm going to finish in 15 minutes. Don't panic. I won't even last one more minute. I know you're tired. Uh, banana roots, uh, no banana roots. Probabilistic boundary curves, Likud, uh, basically, uh, it is a PI and a bit liquidity index, LI, you see that one. Not CSR, not number of cycles, like more like a genetic code of the soil related parameters. And so I'm proceeding. You can see that to be able to complete the picture, we need both field and laboratory work. Field work tells us something, and there are a lot of gaps in the picture, and in the laboratory by simulating uh, the conditions that are lacking in the field. And we'll try to understand the behavior. Now I'm going to do the same exercise, but this time from the liquefaction turning point. I'm done with susceptibility. Now I praise the importance of field and laboratory methods for susceptibility. Now let's do the same for trigger. Triggering, we use some capacity versus demand term comparison. And usually our capacity terms are in situ index parameters in the field, either SPP, shiver velocity, con penetration, tip resistance. Uh, as Arva said, you know, BPT, that's also DPT, they're all like uh, applicable. And then on the y axis, we use a, a demand term uh, in the field cyclic stress ratio. In the laboratory, also cyclic stress ratio, if I recall to you. Uh, field. These are the methods. Uh, capacity terms. How can I bring those capacity terms to the lab? I need some correlations. Uh, we have correlations with SPT blow counts and relative density, cold to distance relative density, shear velocity with relative density, and I need the definition of relative density. Especially soils with fines, uh, you know, how can we like believe in that? I don't believe in that, but at least we have some methods that will provide a transition from field to the lab. I'm a big believer in shear velocity based comparison. Same shiver velocity, identical samples, and then one liquefies, the other one doesn't, then we, that may be more meaningful. But anyways, summary of what we do for uh, capacity. Let's look at the mentor, simplified procedure, see that interest, and because 
Seoul is nowhere near, and because the earthquake magnitudes are different, site conditions are different, and effective stress states are different, we need to apply series of corrections. Let's look at those corrections. Oh, oh, let's look at the uh, shear stresses induced into cyclic loading, R sub D, a lot of corrections. I don't want to go into the details in the laboratory. In the field, we have the magnitude. In the laboratory, the duration of the earthquake is correlated with number of cycles. Then we need some relationships to correlate magnitude with the number of cycles. Uh, this magnitude, that magnitude. Uh, one dimensional loading in the laboratory, three dimensional loading in the field. How is it? Let's play a little bit. Shaking in this direction, in this direction, and then up and down, up and down. And in, in the field, we have a combination of it, which is belly density, which I can't do. So I'm not good at that. Right. So we need those kind of corrections to go from one uh, field to the other, or from the field to the laboratory. And we need to work on that. We need to understand the consequences of those problems. Uh, some summary uh, isotropic consolidation. Anisotropic consolidation. We should correct for that. Professor Triaxial testing under isotropic, simple shear versus isotropic. You know, we all understand that those are apples and oranges. Uh, we need to like focus on those things. And that's what I try to emphasize in this plot. Durational differences in the field magnitude six, seven, eight. See that the duration is different. Let's combine it, convert it to magnitude seven and a half as a reference value. Perfect. These are the correction factors. Whoa, a big difference. Look at it. Name it. Look at the uncertainty. One researcher, very respectful, says it's 1.4. Another respectful researcher said it's 3. So by a factor of 2. Epistemic uncertainty. Anyway, so uh, which one is best? My method is the best. That's what everybody says. Like all the researchers say their method is the best, and they're right about that. Uh, number of cycles. Professor, I would like to convert magnitude to number of cycles. Recent study, uh, you know, we converted transient earthquake motion to equal the number of cycles. Why? We need that to be able to perform tests in the laboratory. Yes. Perfect. 1D, 3D loading, belly dancing, now you see that. Corrections for it. The reason I am repeating those things, sometimes we forget. And we forget making those corrections. And then we say we compare apples and oranges as part of research. And then we reach to all kinds of crazy conclusions. And even sometimes argue about it when everybody's right and they think they're not right. Uh, so that's what I try to emphasize. Uh, stress conditions 50 kPa. Consolidation, 100, 300. So response is nonlinear. We need to correct for that. Reference is one of us there. I wish to use 65. Again, the answers are at least relative to duration scaling. This is better. It's not a factor of two. It's some people say 1.1, the other group says 1.4. Still large. Uh, combining stress normalization. Beautiful example. 40 kPa, boundary curves, 100 kPa, 200 kPa, normalization. The, you see that the resistances are differently emphasizing the nonlinear response of the soil. Uh, so we need to correct for that. Uh, level sites, sloping sites in the field, dams at the edges of the buildings in the laboratory. Professor, should we have a static shear stress before I apply the cyclic stress? They are the coolant questions. And we need to find an answer to that. And we need to find a way to go from the field to the lab again. And these are the corrections. But yes. Uh, and you see that it's full of uncertainty. Again, my purpose right now is to bring your attention to those bits and bits 
that we should be so careful about to be able to make fair comparisons. Uh, I'm starting to the fun part. A nice summary. Professor, what is this slide? It's full of equations. You need to make a lot of corrections. And those corrections are not really like uh, very exact. They're full of uncertainties. You see that? That was a nice summary. So without making corrections, comparisons will be unfair. So I hate to make comparisons between my children. But we do as parents. And this is what I'm saying. Please consider the conditions. Conditions are different. Every character is different. So without considering the conditions, direct comparisons is unfair. So that's what I uh, would like to emphasize. Concluding slides. Let's be nostalgic a little bit. Good old days, triaxial apparatus, courtesy of the, the professor who uploaded it. Wow, all of a sudden, look at it. You didn't see that at the beginning, the cyclic loading was not producing strains. And all of a sudden, can you replay that, please, one more time? No, the, the previous one. Because I see that I have six more minutes, I need to enjoy that. The previous slide, please. Yes, and play the video one more time. I know I can do it, but I'm so excited. Nope. Did I mess it up? Right. Do you see that the, if the video is playing, if you click it? Yes. The deformations are very little. All of a sudden, it goes crazy. Now it's going to go crazy. See? That's why the confection is. And the example is that Imagine you come home, your partner is greeting you at home with flowers. He says, welcome, I missed you, it was a long day. And then when you're about to enter the house, all of a sudden your partner <coughs> hits you in the head. And then you say, what's going on? Like you were just hugging me a few minutes ago, now like you're beating me up. And then the partner hugs you again. And says, oh, sorry, did I hit you? And then he was like, yeah, you hit me, not cheese or he, I'm sorry, partner. I didn't say that. And it hits you again. So this is how like the diffraction response is unexpectedly so sudden and so crazy. Like. Uh, Good old days. Now let's look at fancy uh, designs. Uh, this is the system we designed at uh, Middles Technical University. And we manufactured it thanks to Ahmed El Suleyi. He's sitting right there. Because we're tired of using ready-made equipments, and then after a while, something go wrong, and we don't know how to fix it, and so on. So we designed it, we manufactured it, and yes, now we have stopped using it. It's a three-dimensional device, axial load, one directional horizontal, the other direction horizontal. So it actually does belly density. So it's three-dimensional loading. Uh, Another device. We did the same. We designed it. Uh, by the way, a 12 year effort or PhD students, three of which escaped. Now, literally, I saw the equipment eat the PhD student. You know, one day I came, PhD student said, This is like, Professor, this is too much work. And no hope, and you're crazy. I don't want to be as crazy as you are. And escape. I'm serious, and they're all laughing because they know who they are. Uh, I don't want to mention names. Uh, so, this video, if you show it, it's also applies some torsion and axial load. We're actually using it. If you need help, if you want to have a separate device, contact us. Thanks to Mutasam Zarzur. Berkan Söylemez, where is Berkan? Right there, two PhDs. I was smart, I assigned two PhDs to the equipment. I told my, you know, the equipment can eat both of them at the same time. So they succeeded, it is working. These are the preliminary results. I'm completing, I have three minutes left. Uh, do you see? These are large uh, samples. 
A sample size, Berkan, would you give me? What is the sample size? Diameter, inner diameter, outer? 30 centimeter, diameter, height is 30 centimeter. Height is 30 centimeters, and inner diameter? 10 centimeters, thank you. So, relatively big. And then uh, one video, where was the first one was the video, if you click the video, so at least you will see that I have two and a half minutes. I'm running perfect. I'll finish right on time, just to show you. Now the video, this is real from the lab. Berkan Mutasam, they drew those lashes to see. Again, these are the beginning stages of their testing because they spent a lot of time on developing equipment. So I guess with that, I have proven that it's unnecessary to have a broken heart. Time to reunite. We have the benefits of the field data, the laboratory data. We should find a way to enjoy and uh, put them together to understand and see the big picture. Having said that, I still have one and a half minutes, but I will let go. Thank you so much for your attention. Very much, Professor. Uh, um, there are any questions or concerns now? Or comments? Uh, if there's no question before the coffee break, can I share a joke with the permission of the organization committee? Uh, this is my famous joke. No offense to all the professors, this joke only applies to me. Uh, one gentleman enters to a pet shop and saw a parrot there. And then the price of the parrot was, I hate to see some animals to be sold, but unfortunately that's how it is. Uh, they say it's 2,000 euros. The person asked, why is it 2,000 euros? Because that parrot speaks uh, German, uh, the owner said. And then they saw another parrot. That parrot was 4,000 euros. And the guy said, Okay, okay, like, you know, why is it 4,000? I said, like, that parrot speaks German and French. And then there was another parrot, and the price was 6,000 euros. And then the first guy, okay, don't tell me I know that parrot speaks three languages. The owner says, no, in fact, that parrot doesn't talk at all. But those two parrots, when they talk, they call the third parrot professor. So we told that parrot must know something. We don't know what that parrot knows, but it must be valuable. So that's what we priced on. So that was the job only applicable to me. No offense to uh, professors or academicians, but sometimes uh, you know, we are not good at expressing ourselves and our ideas. And if I made a mistake, we apologize. No, I'd like to invite uh, Vice Chair of GC 101, Professor Ad Design, to uh, present our uh, certificate of appreciation. Okay, I think now that we've finished the session, uh, we can have a, a, a coffee break followed by the third session. But just before the coffee break, I would like to invite the Director of Engineering Division of University of East London, uh, Dr. Arya Asadi, uh, to present our uh, certificate of appreciation to uh, Dr. Ishida.